went to my mother and my aunt, as I would do, because they were the ones there at the time. And I said over dinner one night, I'm having these dreams about Tony Costa. Did something happen to me? Did, you know, what's the story? Why, why is this happening? And as if she were telling me that so-and-so became a dentist, she said, well, I know he became a serial killer. I don't know what the big deal is. Well, he didn't kill you, did he? And so that was the beginning of my journey. And, and the beginning of our right book, because that's a hell of a quote that you never let go. Sylvia and me. 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 Hi, I'm Sylvia Beckerman, host of the podcast series, Sylvia and May, conversations with extraordinary, inspiring women. I'm Liza Rodman, and I'm one of the authors of The Babysitter, My Summers with a Serial Killer, which, believe it or not, is a true story. So welcome. And I'm Jennifer Jordan, and I have been a journalist and a writer and a radio broadcaster and a television talent for way too many decades. <laughs> and I'm pleased to be here and welcome to Sylvia and me. Ladies, thank you so much. And Liza, you said the name of the book, uh, The Babysitter, My Summers with a Serial Killer. Not a summer, but summers. So the first I have to um, say, the two of you I know have been friends, longtime friends since college. Liza, um, how did it even come about um, that you contacted? You, did you tell Jennifer a story? I mean, why um, the two of you on this? And before we get into the actual story, why did you want this to be told? Uh. The answer to the second question is, I almost didn't want it to be told, but it wanted to be told. So I went with it. I sort of described it as going down the rabbit hole and never coming out. And as far as Jen is concerned, Jen and I are friends 45 years or something. Um, and so we talked about it on and off over the years. I had been researching for many years, kind of as an excavation of self more than anything else. I didn't know it was going to be a book when I started. But once I discovered that Tony Costa was a serial killer and had uh, been in my life, I wanted to know how much he had been in my life. You know, the who, what, when, where, why of it. So in talking to Jen about it over the years, um, she would say, how are you doing? How are you doing on the babysitter? How are you doing on the babysitter? It was a kind of a constant conversation. Sometimes I'd, been, I'd put it away. Most times I was going, no, 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 please don't ask me. So, um, then one day in 2018, she was between projects and she called me and she said, how about we collaborate? And as she tells it, and I love how she tells it, I cried <laughs> and the rest is history. Here we are. So Jen, why, um, I, we'll talk about the story in a couple of minutes, but I know that you've ghostwritten a couple of books. Have you collaborated on books before? Well, a ghost project is total collaboration. So my the quick answer is yes. But I, of course, never collaborated. They were both, the, the two other books were both clients. They hired me from a pool of writers. And the, the unique and wonderful thing about this collaboration is that it's with one of my oldest, dearest friends in the world. And, um, you know, as Liza said, since that infamous day in college when we met, so uh, yes, and yet uh, not in, in as special a way as this one. Okay, so we're gonna get to the story now because it's an amazing story. It goes back to somewhere around 1968. Um, you used to spend the summers with your sister, your mom, and I think your aunt uh, in Provence, Provincetown uh, on Cape Cod. Um, and your sister called it you know, it's, it's, it's so rural, it's like the wild, wild west of, of the Cape. Um, so your mom worked, and um, how did, we mentioned the name Tony Costa, how did this man who was a, a, you mentioned that he was just a nice, kind, uh, handyman, how did he come about uh, being your babysitter? 
So haphazardly, um, <laughs> the, he was, um, my mother was working as, the, as a chambermaid um, at this motel that was owned by my aunt and uncle. And they hired Tony's mother, Cecilia, as a chambermaid at the motel. And so my mother was working with her and she was working there and Laura, my sister and I were there. And uh, her, Tony was always looking for work. He had a very unstable work history. And so at that time he was looking for work. And so he went to his mother and he said, here's this big, beautiful new motel on the water in Provincetown. It, it was quite a splash when it was built because there was nothing like it there. And so um, he said, can you get me a job? And so Cecilia went to my aunt and said, do you have something for my Tony? And she said, I'm always, he's a carpenter. He's a, you know, he can do anything. He can uh, wire lamps, he can do anything. And so she gave him a job okay. and that's how I met him. And then eventually he wound up babysitting for you and your sister. The way he ended up babysitting is, is um, so we've got women who are young. My aunt and my mother were both quite young. They were in their early thirties, I think. And um, they loved the bars downtown. And so they were always looking. We had lots of babysitters during this time, lots of them. Tony, ironically enough, was the best of those. And so it was, it was, and his mother also was a really great, she used to take us home with her at night sometimes. So they were busy living their lives and we needed some kind of care in the Wild West. So that's how he became, so he would drive the truck. My aunt tells a wonderful story about standing at the front desk of the Royal Coachman and watching him come up the front driveway. There was a, quite a long driveway leading up to the front, to the lobby of the motel. And he, she'd, she'd yell to the back, here comes Tony. And out we'd go with our towels and our flip-flops and beg for a ride because he was fun. So we always wanted to get in that truck. We always wanted to go with him. He was like that cousin that everybody has that you wanna be. You know, you wanna listen to the music and wear the same jeans and all of that. Um, he was that to all of us. He was, he was like a circus in a way. <laughs> Okay, so before we get into, Jennifer, how you became involved, Liza, when did you all of a sudden, I mean, uh, it's not all of, it took about 30 years from the time that you discovered that this nice guy who was the best babysitter for you and your sister, um, had started a killing spree about the same year, 1968, that you met him. Mm -hmm. So what triggered even thinking about him because you didn't know what he was? Yeah. So I was, I had gone back with, with a, I kind of left a trail of unfinished things in my life. And so in, in my 40s, I decided to go back and finish my bachelor's degree. And when I did, I started having these uh, nightmares that were kind of in rapid succession. They were violent. There was always a man with no face. I was always being pursued and chased. And so I did what I do, which was to write them down and start looking at them and saying, what's happening to me? You know, do I have a brain tumor? I mean, what's happening to me? And so um, as that happened, it went over about a six month period. And then one night, I had a dream of Tony with a gun to my head backed up against the wall in the Royal Coachman lobby. And so that was incredibly alarming and frightening. And suddenly I had a face on this man from the dream. So I went to my mother and my aunt as I would do because they were the ones there at the time. And I said over dinner one night, I'm having these dreams about Tony Costa. Did something happen to me? Did, you know, what's the story? Why, why is this happening? And as if she were telling me that so-and-so became a dentist, she said, well, I know he became a serial killer. <laughs> I know. I'm sorry. And she said it just like that. Well, I know he became a serial killer. And of course, I think 
you know, I've done a lot of uh, interviewing and talking to folks about this, and I've started to think that maybe they didn't realize at the time that when he was arrested in 1969, that he had been sort of haphazardly looking after us a day, you know, we'd go with him wherever we went, and that we'd been in his company while this was going on. I'm not sure they made the connection. Uh, because when I said to her, are you kidding me? You know, my husband said, I stood there and said, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God. Because all of a sudden, a lot of things started to make sense. So uh, she said to me, look, I, you know, I don't know what the big deal is. Well, he didn't kill you, did he? And so that was the beginning of my journey. And, and the beginning of our right book, now. because that's a hell of a quote that you never let go. <laughs> so Jennifer, when did you find out uh, this little bit of history. Uh, she told me about the dream close to when she had it. And so I, I knew she'd been struggling with kind of coming up with the topic for a book. And I said, what are you talking about? There's your book. The ba and it's going to be called The Babysitter. I mean, it's, it's one hell of a story. And uh, so she, she went for it and she wrote versions of the various memories she had and and the Tony story she had, but it's a tricky structure. It's a tricky narrative structure. So she kept stumbling over how to coalesce the structure into a book. So, and I heard about the struggle whenever I would ask, as she said about, you know, how's the babysitter coming? How's the story coming? And so at one point I was between books and I said, listen, this is just has to be written. Let me help you do it. And so that was the beginning of it. And you know, Liza, let me just interject something here that just occurred to me now. As one of the one of the frustrating things about writing a book is because once you write it, you can't add more to it. But I'm realizing that we didn't even have a discussion in the book about how, after 35 years, Tony's face was so instantly recognizable to you in a dream. Because I had a lot of babysitters when. You know, I was also the uh, child of divorce. So we had a lot of babysitters. I'll be damned if I can even remember a, a name, never mind a face and a name and a, and then a series of stories. So it's, it's like, wow, how come? How yeah, I, think it was, I, I think it was the regularity with which it happened. Yeah. Let's maybe. remember during writing, during this writing process, I actually had someone contact me who said, don't you remember me? I used to babysit for you. And I didn't remember her. But the Tony and Cecilia thing was something different. Um, it was uh, separate from my mother. You know, we were off somewhere else. Yeah. Cecilia would take us to her house. So, and I was always looking to belong somewhere because I clearly didn't belong in my family. Right. And so, or at least as a, and, that's, that's the way it felt to me. Right. And so, um, I think there was a sense of acceptance with them. And I think it was over a series of years. It wasn't just on a Wednesday afternoon one day. Right. And it wasn't just one summer. And so as time went on, and then we lived a little bit in Provincetown. So I think there was more exposure. How and old so, were you? I always remembered Cecilia's yellow sweater and her, you know, all those images of her and her warmth. I was seven, eight, nine, and 10. Okay, so it was a four year period. So mm -hmm. it was before he started his killing spree or right when he did? Before, as far as we know. So here's a question for you. Um, had you ever read anything after he was arrested? I mean, did you? Yeah, I'm sure I did. I'm sure I did because I carried some images into my adulthood with me that come right out of one of those press conferences. So I must have heard something. But you know, as I look back, I'm not sure I knew. Cecilia had a different last name than Tony because she was married again. So I'm not sure at seven, eight, and nine whether I even knew their last names. Mm. And so I really can't tell you whether I did or not. That, that makes um, a lot of sense, though. Yeah. So I never connected yeah. it. Okay, so the two of you gave a voice to this to this book. Um, Jennifer, what part did you play? What did you? What was your role? Did you do investigating? Were you putting 
the work, the investigation that Liza was doing together. How did you guys split up what you were doing? The easy answer is yes. <laughs> cool. I like yeah, that. It all. Yeah, so Liza had, all, by the time I came into the project, Liza had already done 15 years something, even more, of incredible research. She'd already been to the archives in Ohio where the all the papers from the trial and Tony's attorney and uh, Tony's would-be biographer, all that stuff, she had already gone and combed through it. She had already amassed a file of the press clippings. So, and, and as she said, she'd already written uh, just draft after draft after draft of these stories that were coming to her head. So I, uh, when I came in, I first started kind of organizing, organizing all this plethora of information into a narrative structure and right away realized that it was, yes, a memoir in that young girl's voice, but it also had to be an omniscient narrator telling the reader what was happening after he bought the girls popsicles, after he took them to the, his secret garden in the woods where, oh, by the way, there were already two and soon to be four women buried. So I wanted the reader to not only live in the voice of the little girl, but then go into the horror of the true story happening in real time. So I, just, I came in as just sort of organizing and then working, once the structure was organized and Liza and I worked cheek to jowl on almost every word going back and forth with what she had already written and then what I, I mean, polish is the wrong word, but um, really kind of help massage into the book you have now have. And fit it into the structure too. You were right. expert. It, in fact, it was Jen who said, oh, Liza Tony, Liza Tony, Liza Tony. And it, it was like this moment of angel singing, you know, <laughs> where it seems so simple now looking back, but it was not. And so when she said that, and when we decided to go with that. It was a, a watershed moment. So you've been working on this book for about 15 years. So it was about 15 years ago that you started having these dreams. And you 2005. Spoke, okay. And you spoke to your mom and she all of a sudden tells you, yeah, um, yeah, no big deal. Um, how did that affect you i mean what emotionally that that has to be so jarring um because you said she said he it, it seemingly he went on a spree a murdering spree mm -hmm. i mean back in the 60s the terminology of serial killer wasn't one that was you know out there but in 2005 it was out there and you know you have the boston strangler i mean you're you're, you're talking about big news uh, big horrific news yeah i mean i can't tell you what she knew ahead of time she was uh but what i can tell you is she did know and she did use that phrase and that's interesting it just when i just heard you say it that serial killer didn't come up it, there wasn't a word there wasn't a phrase in 1969 and yet she used it with me in 2005 so she had to have thought of it so and they had to have discussed it but it well, i wasn't privy to it and so the way it affected me i, I would like to tell you that that was a, a bad moment in some way but i was used to my mother i was used to her flippant replies to things i was used to a long history of not instability so much as, you know, devil may care, whatever, if you're not bleeding, don't bother me. You know, I was used to that with her. So it wasn't that big of a surprise to discover that suddenly she was disclosing this. I had asked the question, what happened to me? Did something happen that I don't know about? Because I always felt that way. I always felt that there was something they had that they were hiding and it had to do with me. So in a way, she set me free in that moment because I found some place to go to start looking. And I suspected that perhaps there was more to the story um, just generally. And it just felt like a watershed moment. 
And so I, I, I went right to the right to the computer, right to early Google. <laughs> so Jennifer, did you feel being as close to Liza as you are, did you feel when, when she started having these dreams and then found out, did you feel that this was something that she really needed to write about in order to kind of, I don't know whether therapeutic's the right word. I mean, my word, you know, when all of a sudden you realize you were basically in the hands of you and your sister for, for four years of a guy who is a serial killer. Did you encourage Liza? Did you think it was, you know, something that really not only needed to be written, but written for her? Um, no, my thought was, my thought was totally bestseller. That was my first thought. <laughs> Like, Liza, you've got to write this book because not only, you know, are you finally going to write your book, but it's going to just fly off the shelves. And the more I thought about the, 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 just the remarkable fact that she survived a serial killer was, and again, I, you know, I knew her mother. I didn't know her well, of course, but I, I met her on a couple of, a couple of occasions. So I knew that more than anything, that she needed to understand why her mother hired a serial killer, why her mother was so detached and so neglectful and so, well, literally, literally out to lunch um, that she didn't notice that this man, yes, he was charming. Yes, he was handsome. Yes, he was, you know, a good handyman was also running off the rails. Uh, with drug use and with unpredictability and with not showing up for work days at a time. So where was she in noticing that her children were going off in the utility truck with a really unstable character? So that, that was more than anything, my thought after I got through the, you know, the, the bestseller lights. Yeah, yeah, right, the, the flashing lights. Was that Liza's got some, uh, you know, we all have we all have demons from our childhood, but uh, what what Betty did and didn't do in uh, just in the Tony chapter of of hiring and allowing Tony uh, unlimited access to her girls was for me like woof, we gotta I gotta help Liza understand this and figure this out. I I was um, recently as I was writing the book had a conversation with someone else who was there um, who is in the book in disguise, if you will. And what she said to me was, when her mother left the room, and her mother was my auntie, she said, make no mistake, it doesn't matter what they told you, we were neglected. Remember that. And, you know, there was all of this, as I said before, I had this feeling that, you know, I had all these stories, I had all this stuff going on, but that there was somehow something wrong, and that I had no voice. And so, because they all knew something about me, I didn't know. That's how it felt. I don't know that that's an accurate betrayal, but it's how it felt. Right. And so when I started to get both from Jen and from other people in my life, and then that was a very significant conversation to me um, that somehow I see you, you know, I see you. I see that's how I felt. And we'd never talked about it before. So a lot of this stuff goes untalked about. And long-term, I hope this book starts, at least helps conversations like this along so people aren't harboring this stuff, thinking well, that they're alone with it, because that's how I felt, very alone with it. So when Jen came in and said bestseller, I was like, I'm on board, because now I have a voice and she's gonna help me. She's gonna give me a voice where I couldn't give one to myself. I mean, what kind of a huge gift is that? It's profound. It's a huge gift. Yeah. That's the whole idea behind all of this is, is, is you need to use your voice. Right. Uh, you, um, you found your voice, not right. even knowing that it was suppressed. Mm -hmm. It was being suppressed. You found your voice. And Jen helped you put that voice out there, yeah. which, as you said, hopefully will help others to know that, yes, um, if you're feeling something, there could really be a real reason behind it that speak out, ask why, ask what, um, and you might not like the answers, 
but it may give you other answers to who you are and, and you know, either close some chapters or open some, some new ones. And um, it's, it's a scary story. Um, scary it, time. Uh, it, it, big time. Um, how did that, I know you have, what do you have, three children? So how did that affect you in, in how you treated your children? Did you tell them about this, this story? You know, that's a good question. Um, I think they've lived with it, pieces of it their whole lives. I mean, I think there are kids out there who have no idea what their parents' background is. My daughter had to put it down. It really upset her. My son was like, I'm in it. Oh, how great is this? <laughs> My oldest son is in the caretaker way that he is, um, was just very supportive. So they were all in different places, different people, but I, I think to their benefit, when I, two of them are my stepchildren, but they came to me very early. So I, I, I don't even like the word stepchildren. So, um, because I was one. And I know what that feels like. So I went way out of my way not to have that happen. Um, so when I had then a son, I went to therapy because I could see my mother. She kept coming out and I was like, yeah, we're not going to do this. So that was really when I hunkered down and said, I've got to do the work or I can't be there for these kids. And even now, you know, I, I, I sometimes will open the door and say, oh, that's where I failed. I better tell them. And they're, they're like, please don't call me again. <laughs> really about it. So, um, but we had an open conversation about these kinds of things because of my background, because I, I was so susceptible to self sabotage, and I didn't want them to be. And what was remarkable to me, Sylvia, in talking with uh, Liza's youngest, who I've known since pretty much the day he was born is how, and Liza talks about this in the book, which was one of the many times that her courage in being so honest was just mind blowing to me. But she says that she confronted her mother and she said, you know, the abuse stops with me. I am not going to, not only am I not going to abuse my child, but you're not gonna touch him either. Like that's it. Because as far as we can understand, there has, was a history of abuse in her family with her mother and then the grandfather. And Liza very bravely, and as I said, in the book very bravely says, that's it, stops with me. And uh, and, and after we had um, one of our events, it was actually you know the, the book party, the Zoom book party, uh, the youngest son called me up and said, just thank you so much for helping mom get this out you know, and not only get the Tony story out, but really ferret through some of the darkness with her mother and therefore ferret through some of the latent darkness in her. Mm -hmm. That uh, the, the, yes, yeah, cool. the book did it, the book helped do it, but also, you know, you've been in such great uh, determination to work in therapy and to work with other people who have, who have helped you uh, come through and come through with such love and gentleness and and uh and voice i mean there's another thing i wanted to say about the voice this book didn't give liza voice liza's always had an amazing voice the first moment i met her uh it was the voice that was so pure and so strong but the book and telling the story through the book helped her trust the voice okay. i think Okay. I trust the voice in a way that, that maybe you hadn't before. Is that, is that, is yeah, I that... think that's accurate. I, I think that by the time we got to tell this story, part of the point is to give it that universal thread that can appeal to other people. It's no longer a personal narrative. It's, it's a personal narrative bumped up against something else. And, and, and you hope there are people who can then relate to that, relate their own stories, their own pain, their own, you know, that's the art of it. So it wasn't just a, a personal narrative in that way. It was an attempt at connection. And yeah. As you said, and, and Jen, and, and as you said, um, to trust your voice. And that is 
really key. I know we keep saying, and the whole thing is, you know, uh, women have a voice. We're now being heard. But before we can be heard, we have to trust our own voice. Right. Um, so and trust that it's valuable and trust that it's interesting and trust that it's it's going to it's going to add to the conversation because I think, well, I don't think we women know that we historically have been undervalued as a voice yeah. in society, in debates. Um, you know, how many of us have heard when we really get excited about something, oh, just calm down. Mm -hmm. just calm down and really what that's telling us is it's not very interesting so just stop talking and it's just so we have all these you know all these other voices all these destructive voices informing us how to be women in society and i think this is a really wonderful time for us uh maybe as a gender but certainly as a generation to say hell with that my voice is important. My voice is smart. My voice is funny. My voice is valuable. And yes, my voice is angry and all these things. And it all matters. And everyone should hopefully through the process, their own process, find that out and really, you know, find a rampart to sing from. And I, I think one other thing that I really want to get in if I have time to do that is that my mother had no voice. She came from the corseted 50s. Mm -hmm. She was in a Catholic family who, I mean, it, so when she got to the 60s, she was breaking out as well. But she did everything she could at, with both my sister and me to make sure our voices weren't heard. And she didn't do that necessarily out of uh, consciously. I don't think she knew what she was doing because that had been done to her. So that repetitive pattern, that sort of generational transmission, I think that's part of the reason it took me so long. One of her favorite phrases was, you know, Liza, she thinks everyone's an alcoholic. Well, so, <laughs> you know, so and I mean- She said that because she was an alcoholic. So just put that on the table. So, you know, I mean, it was an attempt at, you know, sweeping things under the carpet. And that's pretty common in families. It's, it's very, very common. common. It's very common. And, and again, we go back to trusting your voice, finding it, using it, but you need to trust it once you find it. A lot of people do talk, but they'll talk and not really trust what they're saying. Um, so kudos. Uh, it's, it's a fantastic book. It's a, you know, it's a historical nonfiction. It's, it's your story. Um, and Jen, in order to, you know, what you've done and putting it together and taking everything that Liza has done, ladies, you worked very well together. The name of the book, The Babysitter, My Summers with a Serial Killer. So now I want to ask you both some information. Liza, where can people find out more about you? They can go to LizaRodman.com and they can find out more than they ever wanted to know. We have a blog post there. We, and both Jen and I are blogging there mm -hmm. on occasion. We have our events scheduled there. There's a place to buy the book. There's some great um, indies that I'm trying to get onto my website so people can link to indie bookstores around the country because they're struggling. So yeah, they are. You know, it's an evolution. And Jen? Yes, uh, again, uh, jenniferjordan.net is my website. And as Liza said, I'm blogging uh, on this book on her website because she's just done a beautiful job in setting it up. And, uh, you know, Amazon and indie bookstores. And thank you, Sylvia, so much for this time. It's been a, you know, it's funny, we've done a few of these. And even though we've known each other 43, four years now, every single conversation is a new one. And that's, that's, that's really a gift. It's and, and, it's, and, and it's because every interviewer brings their own perspective and their own history and their own, um, you know, th th their own impetus. To this. So thank you for yours. This has been a really, this has been a unique conversation is what I'm saying. So thank you. You're welcome. It's been great. You can find us on all of your popular podcast platforms. And of course, our website, sylviame.com. Stay safe, stay healthy, and stay tuned.